In this video, we're going to define the term functional group and look at a brief survey of some of the most common functional groups in organic chemistry. Thinking about functional groups is important because we can think of organic structures as modular with the functional groups being interchangeable pieces that appear in different molecules and behave analogously. We see many of the same types of structures recur in different molecules. For example, the hydroxyl groups here, the carbon-carbon double bonds, all over the place in these molecules, the carbon-oxygen double bonds here and here, for example. An attractive way to think about organic structure is as a set of functional groups latched onto a carbon skeleton. And if we think about the possibilities in terms of the large number of building blocks available for the different types of atoms and how we can combine those into a dizzying array of functional groups, we quickly realize that the number of possible organic structures is massive. It's estimated to be something like 10 to the 60th power, and that is a massive, unfathomably big number. If we're going to make sense of this complexity, we really need to be able to recognize these recurring units and appreciate their properties. And one of the purposes in naming and pointing out functional groups is so that you can recognize them in different molecules, just as we did for the building blocks. This, this is just an application of the idea of structural analogy at a somewhat higher level, involving collections of atoms that find themselves together in different types of molecules. We define a functional group as an atom or collection of connected atoms with similar chemical properties across different compounds. The carboxylic acid functional group is one example. The carboxylic acid includes a carbon-oxygen double bond with a hydroxyl group bound to the carbon involved in the CO double bond. Carboxylic acids show up in a variety of structures. And in all of these molecules, the portion of the molecule that is the carboxylic acid functional group displays similar properties. The first is its reactivity. And this might be obvious from the name of the functional group and the name of all of these molecules in which it appears. Acids, acid, acid, and acid. The acidic nature of all of these molecules can be traced to the carboxylic acid functional group, specifically the acidic proton within this functional group. We can also note that structurally the carboxylic acid has the same structure no matter where it appears. It's defined by the building blocks of which it's composed. Although the whole is more than the sum of its parts in this case, as we'll see especially when we talk about resonance, we can break down every carboxylic acid functional group into these fundamental building blocks. The similarity in structure of the carboxylic acid functional group gives rise to similarities in physical properties as well. And these are often rooted in intermolecular forces based, for example, on the fact that by definition, carboxylic acids can hydrogen bond. We alluded earlier to the idea that functional groups are latched onto a carbon skeleton, and this hints at how we recognize functional groups within molecules. But I want to clarify this a little bit more and say that functional groups consisting of more than one atom typically involve either acidic protons or atoms involved in resonance, or both. In the carboxylic acid, we see an example of a functional group that involves both an acidic proton and resonance structures. The acidic proton is here, and because this oxygen bears a lone pair and is adjacent to a carbon-oxygen pi bond, the functional group is characterized by resonance as well. The atoms engaged in resonance within a molecule typically define the limits of where we sort of draw the line or draw a circle around a functional group. So for example, in a molecule with four sp3 hybridized carbons attached to a central double bond, well, we just tend to call this an alkene. But when we connect a second double bond to the first, now we have a situation where resonance becomes possible. And because all four of the atoms involved in double bonds in this structure are resonance active, we give this entire structure its own functional group name and call it a diene. We do something similar for a triene when a third double bond appears. All six of the atoms in this structure are engaged in resonance, and so this too has its own name. This idea of resonance active atoms forming the borders of functional groups also helps us explain, for example, why we give different names to functional groups involving the carbonyl group attached to different atoms. When we have sp3 hybridized carbons attached here, this is what we typically call a ketone. 
but if we connect an atom that can engage in resonance with the carbonyl group, such as an atom with a lone pair like nitrogen or oxygen, we've all of a sudden generated a new functional group since now we've enlarged the number of atoms that can engage in resonance within these structures. We only have the carbon-oxygen pi bond here, but here we now have a system with three atoms that can engage in resonance with each other. And the same is true of this molecule down here. And so because we've enlarged the resonance possibilities, we give different names to these functional groups. Specifically, the nitrogen-containing group is called an amide, and the oxygen-containing group is called an ester. Functional groups amount to common combinations of the building blocks, and we've explored this a little bit already in the context of the carboxylic acid. We combine the building blocks, which are atomic fragments, to create molecular fragments that are functional groups. These molecular fragments are latched onto a carbon skeleton to create organic structures. And the atoms of the skeleton are most commonly just sp3 hybridized carbons connected into acyclic or even cyclic structures. And so in this molecule, prostacyclin, what I'm highlighting in blue kind of represents the background skeleton. All of these atoms highlighted in blue are not really part of functional groups, but just connect the different functional groups to one another. Finally, I'd like to very briefly survey some of the most common functional groups in organic chemistry. Those atoms in the background that represent the carbon skeleton on which the more active functional groups reside are part of what are, what's called the alkane functional group, and these are universally sp3 hybridized carbons. Although we tend not to think of alkanes as reactive or really important to the properties of organic structures in many deep ways, the activation of alkanes as functional groups is an active area of research. For example, getting alkane CH bonds to do pretty much anything is still an interesting problem in organic chemistry. Alkenes consist of a carbon-carbon double bond and sp2 hybridized carbons linked to one another, and alkynes contain a carbon-carbon triple bond with the carbons involved having sp hybridization. Some interesting emergent properties start appearing when we link six sp2 hybridized carbons together in a structure that looks like this. This is called an arene, and you'll hear the parent compound referred to as a benzene ring. We've already encountered the halide functional group, and when the carbon connected to the halogen is sp3 hybridized, this is referred to as an alkyl halide, or a haloalkane. The alcohol we've also seen, and although this atom doesn't necessarily have to be sp3 hybridized, it often is an sp3 hybridized carbon. And finally, a carbon-nitrogen triple bond is characteristic of the nitrile functional group. And here again, at this position, we often have an sp3 hybridized carbon, but not always. An oxygen flanked by two carbon groups is known as an ether, and a nitrogen flanked by three carbon groups or hydrogens is known as an amine. And one point to make here is that the R's that you see in these structures refer generically to a carbon group or to hydrogen. You'll also hear me use the term heteroatom, a heteroatom is simply any other than hydrogen or carbon. And because they bring in interesting reactivity, we often think of heteroatoms as part of functional groups. In fact, there's a name for the functional group associated with essentially every heteroatom because of their unique properties. Of course, heteroatoms then pretty much amount to all of the elements in the periodic table except carbon and hydrogen. So that brings up the daunting question of how many functional groups are there? Well, as long as you keep in mind our idea to reason by analogy, the number of truly distinct functional groups actually becomes manageable. Whenever you encounter a functional group that appears new, try to make analogies to groups that you've seen before. So for example, on this slide, I've shown a couple of examples of sulfur-based functional groups that have more familiar analogies in the second row of the periodic table. For example, the thioether is analogous to the ether, as suggested by its name, and the thiol is analogous to the alcohol, also suggested by the name of the sulfur-containing functional group. The carbonyl, the imine, and the thiocarbonyl functional groups are all analogous because they all involve carbon bound to an electronegative heteroatom through a double bond, and so these are all important polarized pi bonds, and all three of these functional groups display analogous properties and reactivity.
And keep in mind that drawing analogies doesn't just allow us to see similarities. It allows us to think about the differences in rational ways. What happens when all I do is replace an oxygen with a nitrogen atom? What happens when I replace oxygen with sulfur? Well, we can start thinking about differences in atomic properties once we recognize that this is the key difference between these structures.